The voice of Sherry. Do you understand? Hi, this is Arlene, and you're listening to Do and Asian again. To our third segment of today, which is the ABC dialogue or the ASEAN Breakfast Call dialogue, and today we have a really special guest、uh, all the way from Sabah, and her name is Jenny Lasimbang. How? Hi, how are you? Hi, thank you, Aline.、Uh, yes, I feel that this is a day where all the people from either Peninsula or Sabah Sra or the whole of Southeast Asia will feel proud of you know being part of、um, their. Uh, being part of this、uh, land of Southeast Asia, I believe so. Yes, it is.、Um, so, in fact, it's the, the whole world. The celebration is a、uh, uh, UN uh, declared uh, celebration, and it's celebrated by millions of Indigenous peoples all over the world.、Mm-hmm. Uh, just want to just get a bit of a background of you. You are. Uh, Vice Chair of Bersi 2.0 in Sabah, as well as you are part of this organisation, which focuses on the indigenous people in,、uh, I guess, Peninsula as well as、uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Yes,、um, yeah. I'm currently the Secretariat Director of the Jaringan Orang Asal Se Malaysia,、um, or JOAS,、uh, and、um, this. Uh, Joas actually、uh, work with indigenous peoples,、uh, and I basically supervise the programs that involve outreach, capacity building, land rights,、uh, and other campaigns, as well as program for capacity building of women and youth.、Mm-hmm. So you being involved、uh, with the work related to indigenous people, how does it feel?、Uh, You know, doing such work and interacting with、uh, the people that I guess people like us、uh, would usually normally would not uh, be uh, meeting them in a frequent basis. Well,、um, I think it's good. The Joas、uh, tries as much as possible to to have awareness program. Now we have a very strong media. We have the Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we're currently、um, redoing our website,、um, and the whole idea is really to to get、um, the members of the public to to garner support for indigenous peoples because、um, most people do not understand ways of life of indigenous peoples. So、um, that's how we try to do. We we interact. Uh, as much as possible. So this is having the celebration actually, or, or other events that we have. It's a good opportunity for us to to talk to people, to you know, in,、uh, and we are particularly reaching out to the media, the government,、mm-hmm. and other members of the public. Yeah. Looking at the bigger picture here, I mean, not just about Malaysia or Southeast Asia, but the whole world. Why、uh, the UN establish a day on the ninth of August to celebrate the indi- indigenous people? What is the reason behind this? Yeah, well,、um, when、uh, previously we had the、uh, humor,、uh, Commission on、uh, Human Rights before it became now the. Uh, Human Rights Council in the、uh, UN, no, based in Geneva, and they used to have this working group on、uh, indigenous population. And、uh, through this、uh, through this program、uh, or this working group, they found that、uh, there are so many issues.、Uh, the situation of indigenous peoples is、uh, is very serious. So actually, in 1993, they、uh, declared it the year, International Year of the World Indigenous Peoples, and They also uh, uh, declared to have a celebration each year、uh, on the 9th of August because that was the first、uh, session, the date of the first session of this working group. So even during that time,、um, they felt it was very important、uh, to raise、uh, the understanding、uh, of the serious situation in which、uh, Indigenous people find find themselves. So this was basic the history, and then. They had the the UN then declared、uh, the decade, the first decade,、uh, Indigenous peoples, and then the second decade, which is actually ending this year. They have ten ten、uh, years, so it's already been 
20 years of trying to raise. Wow, 20 years is a long time. 20 years, yes, yes, that's right. Mm. So the Indi- Indigenous uh, Day celebration, Indigenous People's Day celebration in Sabah, um, who is the organizer and what would you be expecting uh, to do on that day itself? Yes, so if this is uh, the the celebration is a, a time where um, Indigenous people uh, basically JAWS, which is organizing the, the Indigenous Person Network of Malaysia. Uh, so all its members, about uh, 80, 83 members, um, uh, members meaning community organizations and, and village, um, will uh, try to take stock of the situation. What is the, the current situation? What are the important issues that they're facing now? What needs to be done? It is also meant to celebrate uh, the achievements, no? achievements of Indigenous people on, uh, over the year. So uh, we take turns, the, the region, we divide Malaysia basically by two regions, Sabah, Sarawak Peninsula. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, the, um, they rotate the, the hosting of this celebration. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, so this year is, is Sabah. It's a national level. And actually there are also... Uh, uh, village level and also state level celebration um, by indigenous peoples and uh, but this one is a national level so it's it's a very um, important day because you know in a way we the we hope the aim uh, is to in terms of outcome we want to highlight uh, specific issues for example this year is on customary law mm-hmm. how do we try to bring out uh, better understanding, better recognition of customary law, uh, both in uh, legally uh, in our constitution as well as you know acceptance uh, in the courts and uh, among uh, the, the government departments. But it's also meant to strengthen uh, because all the members they will send their representatives um, to the celebration, and it is meant to strengthen the the network. And for those who are new, uh, like uh, we try to attract as many people as possible, and that is the time where uh, we try to do an outreach of, of what uh, what are the the aims of uh, you know organizations, community organizations who are trying to also um, struggle uh, to achieve rights, their rights, and uh, also and how they they are protecting their own rights as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for Malaysians in general, I think uh, the expose on the awareness of what are the indigenous people and who are, who they are, the demographic, is I'd, is almost a zero. And I'm just wondering, like, perhaps you can sort of enlighten, pro- provide some statistic or I- just simple info to our listeners here, like, who are the indigenous people in um, Peninsula, Sabah, and Sarawak, and what is the difference between orang asli and orang asal? Yeah, uh, well, uh, first your last question, which is um, orang asal, who are the orang asal? The um, it, orang asal are uh, basically a term that are uh, used by Jaws and also by um, by Suhakam, for example. Uh, it's not uh, a formally uh, used. Um, term by the government at the moment that um, this is something that we we want to to show because then because uh, it basically reflect uh, uh, includes the orang asli in Peninsular Malaysia and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak so it's a broad term uh, of uh, of the natives of Sabah and Sarawak and the the orang asli of Peninsular Malaysia and. And, and the use of the term uh, indigenous peoples, of course, in English or orang asal, then in, in Malay. Um, well, we uh, represent uh, most of the indigenous peoples, are of course, in Sabah and Sarawak. We have 39, about 39 ethnic groups in Sabah. Um, I think at least um, 28 or, or in uh, Sarawak and, and 13 in Peninsular Malaysia. So um, altogether, I think we make up um, about fourteen um, percent of the population. Fourteen percent. That's right. Mm-hmm. 
what about in terms of social economy, where they, their their yeah. their place are. Um, actually, um, indigenous peoples are among the most marginalized people. They are very uh, they are misunderstood in a way. No, um, the the uh, people consider indigenous peoples way of life. You know, the way mm-hmm. the traditional way of life uh, considered backward. Uh, and and uh, generally um, policies on towards indigenous people is to assimilate them, uh, bring them to the town, you know, uh, modernize them. But in fact, they are trying to maintain a traditional way of life. Uh, there's also a misconception that they are against development when they said, when they try to say we want uh, to maintain our culture, we want to maintain our language, you know, we want to maintain a way of life. Uh, and so you find this uh, eroding uh, very fast. Um, but basically, uh, this uh, uh, this form of assimilation or force to become modernized or to become, uh, you know, part of mainstream society is now recognized uh, worldwide by the United Nations as assimilation is actually against uh, the rights of. of the people who want to be identified uh, as themselves, they, they live as a collective, mm-hmm. uh, not so much an individual life. Can you share yeah. with us what do you mean by assimilate, assimilation, um, perhaps policies by government or prejudices by society or any form of um, activities that encourage this assimilation, either negatively or positively impacting those communities? Yeah, one is probably like the first thing is living when you live in a community in a kampong and you live in a bamboo house, patch roof, um, and that is considered poor. You are poor, and um, they try to assimilate you by making you live in a wooden house or a, or a, in a concrete house where you see the rumah mesra or TPRT houses. But actually, in our condition. The boom, bamboo houses, the wooden houses that indigenous people uh, live in are actually m- much better in terms of you know ventilation, in terms of mm-hmm. uh, the situation here. Uh, living with thatch roof is much cooler than zinc roof or very you know I very um, you know unventilated uh, ruma masra or PPRT houses. Uh-huh. They, uh, they usually live in large or long houses. Uh, where you know they're very close as a community, they live as a collective, and this is not seen as you know this is seen as you know a lot uh, you know old fashioned. Uh, the other, another way is uh, you know form assim- assim- assimilation is uh, when you go to school, you only learn Bahasa Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Now there's uh, there's now an introduction of Kadazan or uh, in Sabah Kadazan Jusun and also. Uh, Iban in uh, in Sarawak, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not, and and so they are disadvantaged. Uh, young, the, our um, uh, you know children go to school. They are disadvantaged because they don't speak Malay in the first place. So mm-hmm. they are always behind. And so the fact that um, you know indigenous language are not given uh, importance uh, is another form of assimilation. Everybody should speak Malay. Mm-hmm. And you should not speak your your own language because you know uh, it is it's, in a way you know it is it's not helping you to get a job or anything. And and this is another wrong perception and uh, a form of assimilation. Mm-hmm. Um, another one would be like uh, people are uh, living in uh, in a situation which is very traditional. It's considered um, uh, they are discriminated upon. And, mm-hmm why they have to be assimilated. They are different and they are considered poor uh, and so uh, they are normally uh, they, they are normally targeted uh, for poverty eradication. We actually have our own traditional way of life. We have our own system of life. We have our juridical system, you know, our court system, a way of resolving conflict uh, which thankfully has been recognized in Sabah and Sarawak. But our social uh, social relations, for example, cultural and political uh, relationship has been uh, not been recognized. Um, in the old days, we used to have a council of elders 
but now it is more like JKK. Now it's all introduced, no? Mm-hmm. So these are all there are many many forms because we have at least ten different systems uh, that govern our way of life. It's very different. Some of it are similar, like the Adat Perpati, maybe similar to some of the uh, the Samia and the Jakun, for example. But um, it's really a different and a way of life and. I think there's a lot of um, that's why I'm saying there's a lot of discrimination uh, of of ways of life that are not not considered uh, or not in the mainstream, so they don't understand it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can understand that. But to the indigenous people, why their way of life is very important to them to their existence? Maybe you can explain to us. It's a big question. <laughs> For example, you know, land. Land mm-hmm. is uh, very important. It's a central to identity. I mean, we want to. The whole reason why you you have a certain way of life is a part of your identity. I am mm-hmm. a Kazakh because of my language, my my traditional um, way of life, or my way of doing things. Uh, the way I, you know, our livelihood, uh, which is usually subsistence. There are some changes to the economic system uh, which they have adopted, but particularly on identity, you know, the stories, the moral, uh, where the, our worldview, uh, mm-hmm. how we see the spiritual worldview, this, are, uh, this gives you identity, it tells you who you are. Um, and just as an example on land, no? land uh, when I talk about land, it encompasses settlement. Uh, the settlement areas, or the kampong, you know, uh, the forest, the rivers, uh, the production areas, and also sacred or burial sites, some of our recreation. And it's also a way in which we see the knowledge or learning is being transferred to the younger generation. And and this gives meaning to, to life, you know. So that's why uh, to us, like, culture and, uh, is so important because you know, it gives you the identity of who you are. Mm-hmm. And, and that is why you are indigenous, and uh, and it's a collective. You know, we we live in a co- uh, collective. Uh, I mean, we hear about Gotong Royong. Yeah, you. of course. This is an embodiment of the life of an indigenous person. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you uh, consider so like you know the original um, Malay, Chinese, and Indian to be, you know, to to ad- used to adopt the lifestyle of the indigenous people? It's, I would probably think. Uh, they have the same. I mean, uh, I think a lot of societies in the very beginning uh, have their own identity. They and I think they they still continue to do so. Um, the that's why. But indigenous peoples worldwide, uh, the term is more um, is more political in a way because it shows you uh, what are their identity, uh, and that's why this uh, the, the sort of understanding the characteristic of uh, indigenous people is that they're marginalized. They are small groups, mm-hmm. non-dominant, and so they're always being discriminated by society. Mm-hmm. Uh, they mm-hmm. are, whereas, you know, like uh, maybe the Indian, the Chinese, the Malaysia in Malaysia are more dominant, no? Mm-hmm. Either it is not economically dominant. And politically as well, uh, yeah, politically. The, the Chinese, Malay and Indian, they have right. uh, organized themselves well enough to have, like, to have a stronger voice in the political yeah, system yeah. itself. So they have their own political uh, organization, their po- political parties, they, you know, they have uh, social... Uh, and even their religion is, uh, you know, is recognized. Mm-hmm. So indigenous peoples have a different way of looking at life, uh, looking at religion, the spirituality. Mm-hmm. So in, in all aspects, they are, uh, they are the, you know, they are a small group and therefore... Uh, not uh, are not part of mainstream, mm-hmm. and the tendency of, unfortunately, the tendency of society is that when you're not mainstream, you are therefore you know have to be assimilated. You have to be you 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 are nobody. You know. Yeah. <laughs> there are claims that the indigenous kids, usually, uh, the, the the percentage of them dropping out of schools, uh, are actually quite high. Do you know the reason behind this? Is it is it because of deeper um, structure reason to it, 
or is it because the education system is itself do not provide the kind of ed- real education that would suit the students or the kids of the indigenous? Yes, uh, I think there are several factors there, and uh, which you already mentioned. One, uh, and this has been, uh, I mean, especially most studies has been done among the orang asli in Peninsular Malaysia. And number one, actually, they find is the discrimination. Mm-hmm. When they go to school, um, people uh, make fun of them because mm. they're different. The look is different. You know, as I said, they, they, you know, the way they think. The way they, uh, they, you know, conduct themselves are very different, and so the first reason why they ha- they have high dropout is that you know you are being discriminated at school, you're being laughed at. Um, I mean, even for us in Sabah, where we're a majority, we have a lot of peninsula teachers from Peninsular Malaysia. They really look down on us. I oh, they do. Telling us, yes, they said, oh, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, really look down now. So I, I, <laughs> I would not repeat what they said, but you know, these are the sort of things they would uh, uh, look down. Um, and then the uh, that's one. So the discrimination is is very uh, is very real. Mm-hmm. Number two is actually the they get disadvantaged because uh, tradi- especially in uh, traditional communities or those in the rural areas, they still speak their language, you know, um, and so. When and they may not know Malay at all, uh, mm-hmm. but when they go to school, um, they they are disadvantaged because they don't they're behind. Some of them may have learned, but uh, the the language that the parents speak may be the broken Malay. Mm. So it actually uh, put them again in a, a further disadvantaged situation because then they will be uh, they have to you know change what having learned. Uh, uh, at home, the Malay that they've uh, learned. So, and you know, it becomes uh, language has become more and more difficult. Uh, as if now, if you look at it, it becomes a, a way of actually um, uh, making uh, children, indigenous children, more uh, you know, uh, in, in the worst of uh, situation. So, language use, the medium of instruction in school is also another one. And as you said, yeah, the third one is actually a. Uh, education, which is not culturally appropriate, mm-hmm. um, uh, many of the the things that they learn uh, is outside of the experience. They, they, that's why it's not as if they don't know. But try to talk to children about going to the forest and indigenous children going to the forest. Uh, you know, uh, picking um, firewood. I'm sure they excel in those things. But because our you know our uh, curriculum is not uh, sensitive mm-hmm. so you know they 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 would not know this you know a lot of people who, i mean a lot of syllabus talks about um, modern urban things no rather than uh, you know giving examples of of uh, more natural of the natural environment uh, about uh, traditional um, occupations for example Mm-hmm. Uh, like uh, agriculture and uh, you know fishing and oh, so forestry and, and all so, this yeah for uh, yeah and all this uh, area where we seldom really talk about you know that involves the environment that's right mm. at first we go straight into uh, uh, I mean the way we use we, the way we learn is uh, is is not uh, is not culturally appropriate for indigenous uh, children so it's very alien to them so Mm -hmm. it it makes it harder for them maybe later they will catch up Uh, but you know the fact that we have you know a rural school so it doesn't open your mind (laughs) uh, then you know it uh, you and a a learning that is just uh, to you know excel rather than to develop yourself yeah those are the this those are the things that uh, then um, become factors of uh, many indigenous children dropping from school, dropping out from school. And of course, you also have those um, uh, children, girls, for example, which are uh, not sent to school, but those are more, uh, I mean, those are becoming less and less uh, of importance these days. Mm-hmm. And you, um Working with all these different indigenous people, when you talk about land, and I know you already mentioned earlier, but when you talk about land, um, I think a lot of indigenous land in Sabah and Sarawak 
in particular has been grabbed for various reasons, either loggings or um, uh, hydroelectricity building and, and many other more uh, reasons. But what I am impressed is, even though they might be economically lagging and politically uh, smaller, having a smaller voice compared to the major three ethnic groups in Malaysia, but it is, they seem to be clamoring out from their uh, their place and and trying to prove a point that you know this is my land and I want to protect it. Uh, where does these voices come out? Maybe you can share with us the history and the various initiatives by this indigenous community in Sabah and Sarawak where they are fighting for their land and trying to preserve their culture and identity. Yeah, well, I was the, I'm uh, previously the Sohakam <laughs> commissioner. <laughs> and mm-hmm. In fact, I was part of the team that, um, the panel that looked at the uh, land rights you know, of indigenous people. So it was an inquiry, a national inquiry into land rights. So. Uh, and I have been working on land issues for a number of years, and it's true. Um, they uh, there's been a lot of uh, issues related to land. For example, unexpected industries, dams, uh, mining, and so on. We also have plantations, um, you know, and and land being, uh, of course, taken. For for various reasons, as you say, for logging as well. Um, why they have come out is because, as I said earlier, land is so central. Um, the loss of land means not only loss of livelihood, but actually a loss of your whole identity. So all the IPs, indigenous peoples who who still see land as a central part of their identity, are struggling to um, protect and and uh, campaigning for for their rights to be recognized um, they they have um, of course mainly uh, appealed their um, the needs to the government they, they, the first uh, the first um, effort that they would do normally is to try and appeal to their representatives to the department to to have their land recognized, and um, but there are many many issues. It's, it started with the um, you know the laws that the British introduced. You know the British came in the first place uh, mainly to uh, to profit from land. They they wanted land to be something uh, of a commodity, uh, and so that it could be bought and sold. That you can uh, put um, you know a premium to it, and so you know. Governments basically can make money out of uh, of of land, uh, and so you know, giving license, uh, inviting investors to invest uh, in the opening of land is it's a huge business for for government, um, and mm-hmm. and they find themselves indigenous people find themselves um, uh, being grabbed, the land being grabbed, uh, they're being uh, they've been fraud even by their own community. Because of this, this clamor for land and for for assets, you know, which is uh, because it has basically been commodified, and uh, even among indigenous peoples themselves, they used to have a collective understanding of land. It is now being more and more um, individualized, and and those uh, who who still live in a, who want to protect a collective way of looking at land, looking at it as a a territory as a whole, and not just an individual part of uh, of of you know the the territory has been uh, you know trying to come up with that. So yes, that's the history. So from the British time, and our laws have become more and more strict, uh, more and more limiting. Uh, in, uh, they have now given land for not only for uh, private. Uh, for private sector investment on uh, oil palm plantation, for example, for for extractive industries, but also um, land is being um, used for um, various other development uh, projects. And so um, communities are finding themselves um, who didn't understand the land laws. They have been, um, or, or the process, the, the processes of, registering their land 
have found themselves in a disadvantage. And, you know, you also have parks, for example, uh, because they're not demarcated on maps. Even those that were mapped earlier by the British, I think, have not, in some places we found, um, even among the orang asli, the people in Sarawak, has become, um, you know, it has been uh, not demarcated on the map. And so when alienation of land uh, happens, they have they find themselves outside of that. There was also fraud, things that fraud that has happened. So mm -hmm. many reasons. And I give you a specific example in Sabah where um, actually the law has various options for land application but they give special recognition actually for natives and that is guaranteed in our federal constitution as well as our, our state laws, uh, land laws. And what they find is that even though there are provisions in the law to recognize native customary rights, it was, that option was not told to them. So whenever they go to um, a, a district uh, land office, they will be told, oh, you apply for the land. When actually there are uh, provision in the law that says, you know, you just write, the village head can write and said, I want this declared as a native customary rights land. And according to the law, a native customary rights land is as good as a title. You know, you have permanent, mm -hmm. heritable and transferable rights uh, to that. And you may not even have to have a title to it. Um, so, but... They've always been told, many, oh, I think most of them are told, okay, you apply, here's the form, you apply. And and that application is applicable to all, all citizens of Malaysia. And anyone can apply land here. And that's an example. No, But uh, that, that provision for general application of land is very restrictive. If any of the department, any of the 14 departments in the Land Utilization Committee says this land has been earmarked for something else, uh, of either for development of a plantation or for, you know, for protected areas, you will automatically be rejected. Mm. Yeah. But actually, if you have native customary rights, that should be given priority. I see. Yeah. Um, so that's the situation now. And yeah. we have been going to court uh, and, you know, each case has to be have to be judged upon uh, and so it, be, it has become so difficult for communities who, who cannot afford to go to the court mm -hmm. Besides land um, if I'm not mistaken uh, economically they are, the indigenous people are one of the bot I think probably the bottom group of the economic classes in this country from your point of view how can we raise the economic condition of the indigenous um, or how can we re re uh, interpret or re, um, prob probably create a different understanding of how life should be for these people and not rank them based on their social class? Because I think uh, economically, the way nation states are functioning, in, um, I mean globally, seems to be in a very capitalistic capitalistic trend is all about the GDP it's all about how much you can educate your citizen so that they can specialize in certain skills that would benefit the country and it's all about material uh, progress uh, for example um, providing a more cosmopolitan cities or building more cities but for for but in your opinion like if we were to look at uh, the lives of, of the indigenous and if we were to measure how a good living standard or a good social economic well-being of the indigenous would be, how would you explain it to us? Yeah, um, I I think if you look at how the world is, what's happening to the world now, we're going through an economic crisis, environment mm. crisis, climate crisis, you know, mm -hmm. I have, and I think indigenous peoples will now say to you that, you know, all this time the pursuit for so-called economic prosperity has, uh, uh, you know, has turned us into, uh, is the one responsible for this crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and indigenous people have always believed that um, the, the whole concept of economy is basically enough. Mm -hmm. You should live enough. Of course, 
uh, and that's the first point to go say how much is enough and and that's why you know we are going towards this crisis uh, they have always believed that the the first thing is actually to serve the family uh, provide for the family and to provide for the community you know and that's why um uh if, in the in, in the situation where um we have for example um uh, the needs uh, your needs are met of course the needs have changed you know um economically um what indigenous peoples in the past would be you know very much an agriculture but no matter you are whether you're a fisherman or agriculturist the idea was really to to have uh, food that is sufficient for the family that's to them the economic and to use you know your resource base uh, for for that and not for profit making mm-hmm. so the, the whole concept the economic concept is, is that and apart from that they it's a very it's, uh, the economic system is very much based on uh, you know uh, a social uh, system that supports each other so uh, much of the 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 economic system is really related to uh, you know, a Gotong Royong style, a kind of uh, supporting each other. Even when one is uh, one uh, member of the the community is uh, you know poor, or they are, for example, um, you know they are um, the the they have the, the husband died, for example, and this the, you know the productive capacity has been reduced, and they, they, they see it as a responsibility to. Mm-hmm. to to support and also to reciprocate um, the, the the other the help that was given before. So um, I see uh, the in the old days they have their own traditional occupations which they have really um, uh, sort of specialized. Whether you know you are making uh, implements, you are you know you are a midwife, you are a, or a healer. Uh, and so on, you have your specific uh, area of work that will serve the community, but at the same time, it will give the particular support for yourself, you know, for your family. Now, nowadays, of course, the material or the economic base is the land. So one of the first things we think that will ensure that uh, uh, communities uh, does not become... You know, uh, you know, fall into poverty is actually to secure the, their land. Mm-hmm. land base. The next thing is actually now because they need schools, they need uh, health, uh, and uh, you know, and also maintain uh, the relationship with the, you know, maybe the uh, communities outside. Is actually to build proper infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And, when you say proper uh, infrastructure, you would mean public transportation. Public transportation roads, uh, you know, access to these roads, especially mm-hmm. uh, those in the rural areas. Here, I mean, you, you go to any air, uh, villages which are in the periphery, we are not served. In fact, the roads are serving the town, serving plantation, serving industries. It's not actually uh, meant to serve communities. You know, the, a lot of our roads here was logging roads, you know, and then just because community is there, then you have a road <laughs> and maybe they improve it. But, you know, the whole idea of development is in this country is basically to, to serve the, the rich and, and, and the investors. So, uh, but anyway, I think that's useful when I talk about infrastructure because then people will will develop and, and uh, develop with a bit maybe of support uh, and organizing uh, so that, you know, everybody, uh, you know, they have access to markets and so on. Having this infrastructure, roads, you know, uh, some shops, that will by itself, I believe, um, develop the the um, the economy, and and really look at the niche market. We haven't even explored actually what uh, what indigenous peoples are doing. I mean, if if we always have developed an organic or you know a traditional farming, I don't think we'll be going into pesticides and uh, chemical. <laughs> Uh, inputs uh, uh, crisis that we're having now, the environmental crisis, water being uh, contamina- uh, contaminated and so on. No? So um, so I do believe that you want to promote a clean economy, You, uh, the indigenous economy has the answer. They have their own traditional occupation. 
just support that. You know, people go to school, uh, you know, to even to community college, they call it, they, they teach you how to make woolly dogs, uh, how yeah. to make hair, how to do makeup, mm-hmm. you know, these are the sort of things you learn. And actually, uh, they have never given any focus to indigenous way of conflict resolution, uh, their way of making, uh, you know, knives and, and chankul and all these implements that can be used. I mean, I'm not saying don't modernize the economy, but that should come together that will also help to maintain our uh, our environment, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and, and keep our, uh, you know, in terms of economy, uh, mm-hmm. keep it within the community. And, and that's what why we are, a lot of indigenous people this day worldwide are talking about food sovereignty. Mm-hmm. It's not about food security anymore because... Food sovereignty means having control over what you plant. Mm. You're no longer... Dependable on the global economy, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So you're not planting oil palm just because, you know, you can... And then forget about planting food. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, that could be one... uh, That could be one aspect of it where... Especially Mm -hmm. communities that want to be uh, more... um, Who want to engage in their traditional economy... But basically, those who might want to engage in more, uh, what do you call it, more modern economy, I mean, they're not rejecting it. They they might go for uh, plantation and other, but, you know, they have been going smallholders and mm-hmm. been very successful because it goes directly, the, the what do you call it, the, the money, mm-hmm. uh, profit goes directly to them. Yeah. We have a few models, not very many models in, in this in Malaysia where um, you know, rubber smallholders have benefited far more than, you know, living in a plantation where, you know, you get dividends, you wait for dividends mm-hmm. and so on. What these indigenous people should receive is self determination either for their land or for their economy. Or even for the education. At the end of the day, I guess what uh, the government and society need to realize is, is to have this sort of awareness when we talk about greener economy, economy that is more in tune with our ecosystem and ecology. It, sh- it should be a conversation that everyone participates because even globally, when it comes to climate change and uh, environmental degradation it has become so bad that you, nobody actually talk about this and not even at the, at the national level. Yes, I think you hit it on the nail. Mm-hmm. It's, it's basically self-determination. Mm-hmm. Trying to, I mean, one is you know, to decide what are the, you know, uh, uh, you know what kind of economy that you want to be best suited for you. Uh, to have control over that, but also, you know, in this uh, the participation, the participation in, in making decisions over, uh, you know, as you said, uh, in the general where it affects the, the environment, in fact, uh, affect you know, our general well-being. We are at the end of our conversation here. Maybe yeah. some last words uh, regarding on the International Day for Indigenous People. This celebration is something that we have been uh, doing uh, 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 annually every year. It's very sad. Actually, I was uh, surprised to hear from um, the government, uh, particularly at the UN the, in New York, where they said they are, or the government is organizing the Indigenous People's Day. But uh, in fact, to me... Uh, that was in particular in 2012 when we had it in Sarawak, and we had so many, so much problems because the government thinks we are, you know, we are. It's it's a negative. Is 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 uh, we are being influenced by the opposition. But you know, all that is being done here is uh, for the celebration is to gain the to draw the attention of of. Uh, of what indigenous peoples are doing, what are the aspirations, and uh, and that yes, if you, uh, it, it should be something that uh, are supported by the government. It's not something that uh, people want to be proud of. So we have been trying to get the government to support, to to be part of this uh, of this event, to be open in terms of uh, discussion uh, on on issues or you know even issues that government may want, the theme that they want to do. 
um, the hard part of uh, of our work these days is when people or the government uh, representatives just refuse to engage. It's mm-hmm. a celebration basically, but we also want certain aspect of it to look at, as I said, specific uh, issues. And in this particular in this particular year, we are looking at customary law. Mm-hmm. What do we want to improve? What are the expirations? Anyway, thank you very much for sharing with us and yeah. happy International Indigenous Day. Thank you.